Hey, it's Jen. Have you ever listened to one of the episodes and thought to yourself, oh, I wish I could leave a response to that, or I wish I could leave feedback or ask a question. Did you know there's actually a way to do that in Spotify now? I know it's super cool. So if you head over to Spotify and search for Java with Jen podcast or Java with Jen hearing God's voice for everyday life, you may have to search all of it. And then you go and check out my most recent episodes. There are polls and Q&A options that you can weigh in on and I can connect with you that way over here on this platform. I usually use Instagram to connect with you guys, but now with this feature from Spotify, it's a super cool way to engage with the content of each episode and talk to me directly. I'm looking forward to hearing from you guys. So go head over to my latest episodes on Spotify and let's do that right now. Okay, so you guys reached out on social media when I kind of put my feelers out there and there was an overwhelming consensus that y'all want to hear how to talk to your kids about sex. Now, I am not an expert and I think every family will have their own nuanced way of doing it. However, with four boys having it, really this was an area that was really important to me as a young person. Um, I've actually thought about this for years, about what made it meaningful to me and and how can I make it meaningful to my children? Because, you know, none of us want to traumatize our children prematurely. We don't want to steal their innocence by giving them more information than they need, but yet we're very aware that if we don't teach them, someone else will, and that's a little scary. So, I share some things that we did in our family with four boys that I feel has been helpful where we're able to have very open, honest conversations with our kids about sex. And it's, I feel like they have a pretty healthy relationship to it at this point. And, um, and so I feel like there's been some success there, uh, and some just helpful things we picked up along the way that I wanted to share. Also, the life hack is I'm going to share some simple little tips for, Uh, pulling off some weight. I know New Year's brings some weight loss goals. And so there's some simple little tips. After having four kids, I have had my share of weight loss challenges and endeavors. So I'm going to share that in our life hack segment. So let's cue that intro music and jump into this fun episode. Hi, and you're listening to Java with Jen with your host, Jenna Lee Samuel. Okay, so let's face it, talking to our kids about sex can actually be awkward and uncomfortable and a little terrifying. And I think nobody, maybe there's some people out there, but like, I don't know any parents who were actually trained on how to talk to their kids about sex. If any of you know a great book on this or some great teaching or whatever, please share it with all of us. And because I will, I'll put that in my life hacks, but Pretty much from what I've learned and experienced among friends and and just life and life as a pastor and life as a youth pastor and a parent, hardly anybody feels equipped to talk to their kids about sex. So now when I was when I was younger, when I was in high school um, in our family, I grew up in a Christian home. And so the concept and the idea I grew up in church. So it was a normal assumption. Sex is for marriage it is bad outside of marriage, but somewhere I picked up a pretty healthy relationship to it in that I knew that sex was good inside of marriage. Did I see a lot of people talking about it or celebrating it? No, um, but the basics were there. Sex outside of marriage, bad. Sex inside of marriage, good. You know, so the basics were there, and I am, I'm a thinker. I'm an analyzer, and even as a young person, I wanted my sexuality to be a gift to my husband. And so my dad, when I was, I want to say maybe 16, maybe a little younger, 14, um, he took me out on a date and we went and bought me a, a gold wedding band that I wore on my finger as a purity ring. And on the inside of it, I had engraved, I waited just for you. A little, you know, cutesy, whatever. Um, but in my heart, I was very genuine. Like I was determined to save myself for my husband. And I think some of that is probably, I was afraid that if I didn't, I'd go off the deep end and wreck my life. (laughs) So there was a little fear wrapped up in there too, but you know, it worked out. I really did want to present that to my husband as a gift. I kept a journal that I wrote in for about seven years up until I got married, um, that I gave to my husband. It probably really wasn't 
I mean, it wasn't fascinating to read, but it was sweet, a sweet gesture. Anyways, so with that being something that was so meaningful to me and important to me, and having four boys, I was like, holy crap, how am I going to teach them this? Like, boys relate to sex differently than girls do. Um, you know, I have all these horror stories in my head of all these boys and the crazy things they do. And so I was like, how do I, how do I do this? After talking to youth kids, observing people's life, listening to their pain points, you know, people who maybe did not have a good relationship to what sex was about, talking to people who had been maybe molested growing up and automatically had a horrible, um, filter for it. I just, I just was very thoughtful about how do I make this a good thing? And then of course I looked at scripture, like what was God's original design? And when it comes to anything in parenting, my desire is to always lead my children to what was God's heart behind this. I feel like when we lose the heart behind a rule or a principle, then we get stuck in legalism and legalism ends up suffocating us. Rules do not bring life. What brings life is the the principles of life and love that drive those rules. And so I didn't want to program my kids, sex is bad, sex is bad, because that's not true. God's heart for sex was that's how life is created. And that's how a husband and wife can can celebrate and enjoy each other without barriers, without um, any shame, without any embarrassment. And it's a way that specifically men really connect emotionally with their woman. And, um, and for women as well, but not in the same way that men do women more connect through conversation and, and communication and stuff like that. Um, everyone's different. Don't send me emails. If you're like, what, that's not me. I understand, but I'm just speaking in general terms. Um, so it was important to me to convey God's heart to my kids. So then you have the challenge of like, well, how do I do that? When do I do that? What language do I use? And so intuitively, I kind of was like, I just think that as soon as my kids have questions, that's probably a good time to start answering them. Because I realized as from my history with youth kids and just listening to them, they would, you know, open up to me as their youth pastor much differently than they would open up to their parents, which I always encouraged them to talk to their parents and be honest with their parents. But I just acknowledged that I had more access to their honesty in many ways. And so I realized that for those students and even peers of mine who had a hard time with sex um, and with what it is and what it's for, usually that was because they had a messaging that attached shame to sex. And um, anytime I think that shame is attached to anything, it steals the life from it and it steals God's heart in it. Um, shame is not God's design. Shame is not a part of God's culture. It is actually an impact of sin and the fall in when Adam and Eve were in the garden, sin came in when they chose to disobey God and immediately they were filled with shame over their nakedness. And so shame in regard to even specifically nakedness is really evidence that there may be sin or a sin mindfulness present. And so I say sin mindfulness because Adam and Eve were suddenly aware of right and wrong and of wrongness. And that's what caused them to have shame. So with our kids, when talking about sex, if we create this climate around sex of bad and good and bad and good, then they're going to automatically have a sense of shame attached to it anytime they get close to what feels like bad. Do we want them to know the lines? Absolutely. They need to know what the lines are and and in what context it's good. But I can, I've always tried to steer my boys' eyes towards God's heart and God's intention because God is good. Sex is not bad. It was God's idea. The world and and the enemy tries to pervert it and twist it and distort it and that's where it becomes um, can become destructive. And so that's what I began to communicate to them. I always started with my kids explaining sex as, um, the good thing that it is, that it was God's beautiful design for making beautiful children. And that, um, now I, (laughs) I did interview my older son yesterday. I should have recorded our first conversation because he he had some real brilliant nuggets to share. Um, But I came to learn that in my 
attempt to not share too much. I apparently was ambiguous enough about sex that he didn't understand where babies came out. And he was very confused for a long time, thinking that babies came out of a woman's belly button. <laughs> oh, I died laughing. I was like, he's like, mom, you didn't actually explain the things. And I was like, I'm so sorry. So, you know, I learned from that. But anyways, we did explain, I think when my kids were really little, like, you know, six, because they start asking around five years old because they... They start to be aware of differences, like socially. They start asking about people who are large and people who are small, people who are tall, people who are short, people who have dark skin and light skin, and then boys and girls. They start to notice those differences around five. And so that's where those questions initially will technically begin. Um, And so I, I (laughs) I had told my kids, I don't necessarily, I don't recommend explaining it this way because I don't think it really got the job done, obviously. I explained to kids that, my kids at first initially, that when a man and a wife um, hug really hard and they're naked, that they make a baby. Okay, that was not a great explanation because Judah told me he thought that when a, like aggressive hugging and kissing was sex. And so whenever he would see couples kissing on TV, he would freak out because he thought he was watching them have sex. So it is helpful to actually give logical, factual information to your children. And something that that helps me realize that it's you're not stealing their innocence by explaining things is because when they're five, six, seven years old, their, their, uh, what's it called? Their puberty has not kicked in. Their sex drive has not kicked in. So the fascination with it has not kicked in, especially if you can just keep it factual and logical and scientific. Um, I think what starts to perk curiosity and awaken things is when they see or experience, uh, things that are perverted or, um, sexually charged then they they begin to pick up on that. So my what I have learned is that it's best and I've seen some parents do this really well and and even like better than I did um is that the parents who explain it just in a very matter of fact, here's what these body parts are called, here's how they work together, here's how a baby happens and here's how a baby comes out. If you just walk them through the whole entire process, all the answers are laid out. You don't have to make it emotional. Don't make it emotional. In fact, I would ex- I would encourage you to keep the emotion out, keep it very factual and logical, explain it, and then if you include any emotion, include the emotion of the beauty of it, of God's goodness in creating it. Because here's why you want to be the first voice on this topic in their lives. There is a principle called the law of first. In the way that our brain is wired, that the first time you learn about anything, it creates basically the foundation that that house is built upon, the house of that concept. So when when you teach your kids about, um, like your kids, their first introduction to love is their parents. And family is their experience of a family. And so their their grid for what is, is built upon their experience and their first introduction to it. So a mother, what a mother is, is what you are to them. That is just what they compare and, and contrast everything in life against. As they get older, they can introduce their own logic. But as a child, you are laying the foundation of all of their reasoning. I know, don't be afraid. It's very terrifying and yet whatever, somehow God trusted us with that responsibility. So when it comes to sex though, um, if I tell my kids sex is good, sex is from God, sex is for marriage, and sex produces babies. These are very true foundational principles. I put those out there and if that's the first time they hear about sex and, and learn about sex, then that lays a foundation that they will then compare everything against. And if then a friend comes along and says sex is, you know, bad and dirty, then my kid in their reasoning will go, but that that doesn't measure up to what I believe and the foundation that was laid. So I'm going to discard what that friend said. They don't know what they're talking about. And so your kid will measure 
everything else against the first voice. Now, if your kid was introduced to sex in another way, I believe that you can reprogram their brain and by, but you have to talk about it on a regular basis. Um, talk about it when it comes up. Talk about it when stuff comes up on TV that we fast forward or that you ask them to turn their eyes from. You know, like talk about it openly because when we keep things secretive and hush hush and oh, we don't talk about that, it creates an atmosphere of shame. You do not want to create an atmosphere of shame around sex because if you create an atmosphere of shame what was adam and eve's response to their shame they went and they hid right and then they lied and then they blamed and then sin had its course right when we introduce shame it causes us to hide it causes us to try to cover up our tracks it causes us to try to blame others it causes this snowball effect of negative harmful behaviors. So you want to erase any climate of shame. I would tell my kids frequently because you can't talk about sex once and it be done with. A, it is a normal part of life. And that's what my son even said. He was like, mom, parents just need to talk about sex because it's like it's a normal part of life because it is a normal part of life. And I was like, you are so right, my son. <laughs> and uh, And I asked him too. I was like, honey, how? I said, I didn't want you guys to grow up with this mentality that sex is shameful or that it's bad or wrong. I said, how do parents avoid that from a kid's perspective? And he said, well, he said, I don't think parents should treat sex like it's bad. I think they should just teach their kids that it's private, you know, kind of like, and, and we gave some examples of like politics. We teach our kids to be private with their political perspective because it can be divisive and that is a personal thing you know we teach our kids to be private about how much money our family makes every family I mean we kind of culturally just understand you don't really sit around and talk about how much how much you make um because it's just you try to be private with that so there's some things in life we just are private about most people are pretty private about how much they weigh you know what I mean like there's just things and so he was like don't treat sex like it's bad just treat it like it's private and we did do that um we did we did teach our kids that, listen, in our home with mom and dad, you can ask us anything about sex. No question is bad and no question is off limits. If you're wondering about it, come talk to me about it. I want to hear your question and I will not make you feel bad for your question. Um, and I had to mentally really be prepared to not have a reaction when they would suddenly drop a bomb of, mom, what is rape? (laughs) Which did happen while I was washing dishes, (laughs) you know? And like, and if I did have a reaction because it took me off guard, I would verbally explain my reaction so that they didn't feel like their question was bad. I would say, wow, okay, Judah, I'm sorry. I wasn't expecting uh, you to ask about that, but I love your question. It's a good question. And I would try to affirm the fact that they were asking and being open and being honest because, Listen, if you're not open and honest about it, they will find someone who will be. And if they don't find someone who will be, they will find something on the internet that will be. And you do not want them finding out about sex from strangers, from kids at school, or from other adults, or from the internet. Um, I know I had a roommate who, when she was a young girl... She was curious about sex, and so she asked her older sister's boyfriend about sex. Well, he took that as an invitation to teach her firsthand what sex was, and he began to to molest her. Every time he'd come over, he would molest her. And so we have a responsibility. They will naturally be curious. Do not be afraid of their curiosity. It is natural. It is good. It's important, and it's an invitation for you to parent them in this area. And so don't be nervous about it. It will come up and it will probably come up younger than you expect. Um, I remember when my son, my oldest, was about six years old. The Lord really started putting on my heart the importance of talking to him about sex. It was on my heart for probably a year. And so I told my husband, hey, I think you might want to just teach him about this. And he was like, okay, well, he he didn't. I mean, he kind of did. He thought he did. But then I pulled my son aside the next day. I said, so did daddy talk to you about sex? And he was like, no. And I was like, but I asked my husband. He said he did. So 
you have to be pretty explicit with kids. And, and even, even yesterday when I was talking to Judah, I said, I remember talking to you when you were about seven or eight years old. And I explained sex to you. He goes, Mom, I didn't know what sex was until I was in fifth grade. And I was like, what? Yes, you did, because I explained it. So they won't always remember those conversations, especially if it's a very low-key conversation um, that you're very quiet and discreet about there it's not going to be impactful because they don't have emotions surrounding it and so it's important that that you visit this conversation frequently and and you know when something comes up on tv like there's a commercial or there's a whatever from a young age from two years old we started teaching our boys no we don't look at girls on tv in bikinis like turn your eyes that's disrespectful to look at that um and, 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 but then we'd also say, when you have a wife one day, you can look at her and appreciate that she's beautiful, but other women, you need to guard your eyes and you need to look away. And, uh, and my husband models that. And so my boys are programmed that when that stuff comes on TV, they'll turn it off. In fact, they'll come to me if they, if an ad pops up on their device or something, um, Benjamin has come to me and said, mom, this came up and it was it was really uncomfortable. So I skipped it and I reported it because it was wrong. Um, but, but I just wanted you to know. And I was like, thank you for telling me, buddy. I really appreciate your honesty and your integrity to protect your eyes and to honor the Lord by how you responded to that. And so always validate and affirm their journey because, I mean, you're the, they're on a journey regardless. We didn't ask for it. They just are. Um, and it's a good and normal part of life. So here's here's a, a pointer that I feel like as soon as they're old enough to begin to ask questions they're old enough to begin to get answers because their curiosity will look for satiation and so if they're curious they're going to find their answer and if you're not giving them their answer someone else will so when they're old enough to ask questions then you need to answer their questions um, answer at age appropriate with whatever you're comfortable. Um, I didn't want to, like when my son asked me what rape was, I think he was eight years old and maybe seven, he was young. And I didn't want to traumatize him with fear. Like I didn't want him to be fearful of that. Um, but I did, so it's very important, especially in those things that you feel like can come with strong emotion to keep it very, very, very non-emotional, um, logical. And so, you know, I explained, I said, well, rape is when someone um, tries to take advantage or, or have someone have sex with them without their permission. And so I didn't make it like this big drama, but, um, but I just explained without their permission, if they, if they try to force them to do something they don't want to do, then that is, that is called rape when it's in regards to sex. And we talk in our house about boundaries and about respecting people's boundaries and, um, listening to people's no. And so the conversations of my home, um, I try to play off of those contextual conversations because I don't know, it just helps. Um, so dealing with siblings, talking to siblings about sex, that, uh, that's a thing. And especially with boys. And, and so I would explain to my boys and, and here's, let's, let's go into how to help your kids know who and when to talk about this. Um, they will want to. When kids come into information that they feel is new information, they'll want to share it with people. They'll want to talk about it. So when I would sit down and talk to them about sex, I made it very clear. I said, listen, sex is not bad. It's good. But it is a private topic that is meant for children to discuss with their parents. I said, this is not for you boys to be discussing with each other because you guys our children. You don't know sex. You don't understand sex. You've never had sex. And that's good um, because you're not married. So do not try to educate each other. Do not try to ask each other your questions. Just come to me and daddy. We want to be the ones to teach you on this. And we also said, listen, if your friends try to talk to you about this, that's okay. But you don't need to have that conversation. You need to tell them, listen, that's not a conversation I want to talk about with you. I talk to my parents. You need to talk to your parents about that. And then I was very honest and I said, listen, because this is such a private matter, if you do decide to talk to your friends about sex and their parents find out, it is so 
personal that parents want to be the ones to teach their kids that if they find out you're trying to teach their kid about sex you could very well lose that friendship and those parents may not feel safe having you as their kid's friend and you could lose that friendship and that sounds maybe drastic but I mean that's the truth if I have a kid who's talking to my kids about sex end of friendship (laughs) you don't get to be my kid's friend you know what I mean and so I I made that very clear to them so they understood the weightiness of the topic um, and had a respect for the when and how to discuss it. And so that's important. You need to give them those boundaries so that they can function with it appropriately. And of course, we have had them push those boundaries. We have had, you know, um, older cousins, uh, you know, try to expose them to stuff. And the older cousin was, was somewhat innocent, but the boys were all just stumbling down a dangerous road together. And thankfully we came across it. We addressed it. We confronted it and we made very clear what the boundaries were again. And, um, there was consequences when they don't act like gentlemen. And when they entertain themselves with non-gentlemanly things, there are consequences and there need to be because, um, sex is powerful Sex is a gift, and we don't want them to be reckless with it. Um, ongoing, there should always be ongoing training and conversation. Always redirect, and this is something I do, I try to always redirect them to the why. I said that already, um, but like when we tell the boys to turn their eyes. Again, I'm constantly trying to be aware the climate that I'm creating around sex or the climate that my husband is creating around sex. And so I even have to kind of coach my husband a little bit like, hey, don't use terms like that's bad, you know, explain the why and whatever. Um, And so when he turns his eyes, uh, then we explain to the boys, boys, turn your eyes, boys, turn your eyes. But then I'll go in later and I'll explain to them how it affects me as a woman. I've had this conversation with my older son and I asked him if this was helpful and he said it actually was. Um, But I've sat down with my older boys and I said, listen, guys, here's why it bothers me when when you look at, you know, the Victoria's Secret pictures when we're walking through the mall or when you're oogling a girl in clothes that are too tight or whatever. I said, here's how it makes me as a woman feel. I said, we as women, we want to be protected. And there are enough men in this world who treat women like they're meat because they just want women to serve their needs. I said, there are types of men who act like this on a regular basis. I said, gentlemen are men who want to protect women, not take advantage of them. I said, but when your eyes are lingering and are and inappropriate thoughts are happening and us girls, we can see it on your face. I said, when that is happening, that makes me, me as a woman, feel unsafe with you. Because now I feel like you are becoming in that category of men who are not safe to be around. And of course, I assure them, like, I know that's not their heart. I know that's not who they are. But I want them to understand the path that they're choosing when they make those choices and what it does to their heart and what it awakens inside of them and the kind of character they're building if they continue to to be lustful and to choose to look at women. And of course, we point to scripture in Job where it says, I've made a covenant with my eyes that I will not look lustfully upon a woman. And I explained to them, like, listen, it's one thing to appreciate a woman's beauty. But when you start to want that beauty or you want that beauty to serve your needs and your desires, that's when it becomes lust. And, um, and I said, we can all appreciate a beautiful woman. But, but when lust is awakened, it becomes dangerous. And I said, when, when I see you guys look at something lustfully, it makes me as a woman feel disrespected. And it, it makes me feel betrayed by you boys because you're my boys who I want to always feel safe like you are looking out for me and you are protecting me and then you know I've used the example I was like if you and I were out at a restaurant and a man came up to me and was looking at me inappropriately or talking to me inappropriately I said what would be your instinctive response and every single one of them is like oh beat him up you know they like they get all aggressive and I'm like okay listen Don't be that man by how you look at women. Every woman is someone's mother. Every woman is someone's sister um, or someone's wife. I said, protect women like you would protect me. And and that kind of helps put it in context for them. And what it does is it calls them 
to the nature of the protector instead of labeling them with the nature of the perverted. You know what I mean? I don't ever want my boys to feel like I view them as a perverted person because I don't. They're men of God. And I tell them that all the time. You're a man of God. And I honor that you're a man of God. And so I call to that man of God nature inside of them. And even when they screw up, I I meet them with gentleness. I meet them with love. But I meet them with honesty. And I'm like, listen, that was a mistake. I know that's not who you want to be in your heart. But I want you to understand how that made me as a woman feel. And so those honest conversations, I think, helps them understand the impact of their actions. And I, and I try to remind them, like, this is your gift to steward. This is your gift to protect. Um, which brings me to my last point. If you want your children to protect their sexuality, they need to want to protect their sexuality. They need to value their sexuality and they value their sexuality when you value your sexuality when you communicate in terms that shows that it's significant and important if if husbands are looking at pornography at home your children are going to learn to look at pornography at home Um, if as couples or as families you treat sex scenes on tv like it's no big deal then that teaches them that cheap sex and loose sex and casual sex, that it's no big deal. So the way that you relate to sex in all those small situations creates a climate and creates a culture in your home that sends the message to them, whether it's valuable and worth protecting or whether it's casual and you can be reckless with it. And so just, and that's, that's not to put shame on anybody or anything like that, but just to be aware of the power of the atmosphere and attitudes that we create with our unguarded actions, with our unguarded attitudes. So when stuff comes on TV, the boys know we skip it. We um, tell them to look away if we can't change the scene or whatever. And sometimes we'll just turn movies off if we feel like it's just crass and inappropriate and we tell them listen boys you guys are men of God we honor the Lord and what we entertain ourselves with and that doesn't honor the Lord like sex is worth protecting and um and I also have taught my boys the point of everything in life that's valuable is protected and has to be fought for and I give them the example of like you know really valuable artwork you don't see it just hanging out on the street you see it put away locked away in a museum where people can appreciate it but they can't touch it and so I help them understand listen your sexuality is so valuable because the children that will come from you are going to be world changers you don't want to throw that around loosely you don't want to be casual with that but it does require you're going to have to fight for it because the world will try to um cheapen it I don't I I try not to make it seem like this big battle but but help them understand the real dynamic is the the world doesn't understand the world doesn't value God's heart behind sexuality and I mean it's it's connected to your identity it's so very personal and um and so I just help them understand like you're going to have to work to protect your sexuality And it is worth protecting. Everything that is valuable will require you to fight for it and to protect it. But that is what makes it valuable. Chris Valatin shared a story um, in his. He has an awesome um, curriculum and series on, I think it's called Battlefield, From the Battlefield to the Bedroom. And he's got videos on YouTube and he's got, uh, I think, a book and maybe even a curriculum that like youth groups and, and people can go through. Um, but he, he shares in it the analogy of this boy who wanted to propose to a girl, but he didn't have enough money. And so he worked hard, worked hard, took on a second job, worked hard, worked hard and, and carefully, slowly put money aside, put money aside, put money aside. I think maybe he didn't have his girl yet, but he had, he knew one day he would propose and he was excited too. So he'd been working towards the ring he was going to buy her. And so he's working, working, working. Finally, he's able to buy this ring. And so then he gets called into into combat, into battle. 
and he brings the ring with him and he wears it around his neck. And so he's in battle and, you know, this ring is going through everything with him and this ring is seeing the world and this ring is, you know, not only did he slave away to earn it and buy it, he's so proud of it, but he has to protect it. He has to keep it in a safe place. He has to make sure it doesn't get stolen. And then when he's on the battlefield, you know, it gets dirty from the battle, but he like cleans it up and he, he fights for it. So it, this ring has been through it. At one point, he thinks he lost it, but he finds it again, and he's like, okay. And so when he finally finds the woman of his dreams, he's so excited to give her this ring, so excited. And he, because he knows all that he's put into to, to buy this ring, to obtain this ring, to protect this ring, and there's so much value because of all the sweat, blood, and tears that has gone into this ring. And he's so excited to give this ring of such high value to this woman he loves. And so he proposes and he gives this ring to this woman and she treats it like it's not valuable. She treats it like, oh, that's not really what I wanted or that's not it's not as big as I had hoped, you know, like I really wanted a flashier ring and how devastating it is if it's not valued. And so he makes the point of the more valuable that ring has so much value because it was fought for, it was protected, it was held close, it was guarded, it was through blood, blood, sweat and tears that that ring was finally able to be given to the woman that he loves. Now, the woman that he loves hopefully would respond to it with just cherishness. I don't remember what was the point of the woman who disdained it, but you also don't want to choose someone who's not going to value that in you either. (laughs) And so for something that's so valuable, you want to give it to someone who's going to value it. Um, But the point was that everything worth, worth having is also worth protecting. And so I explained that to my boys and I said, listen, Once you reach a certain point, like when you're young, that's my battle to fight for you. And it's my job to teach you how to fight that battle. And then once you hit puberty, that becomes your battle to fight. And and we're here to support you. But no one can fight that inner battle for you except for you. But the more you're willing to fight that battle and to to manage your sexuality with wisdom and with self-control and with purity that becomes more and more valuable to you because you're the one putting the blood, sweat, and tears into it. And so I I realized as a parent, when they were going through puberty and they were struggling not to look at things or whatever, it became very personal to me. But then I had to remind myself, Jenna Lee, at some point, this isn't your battle anymore. It's their battle. And so I pray for them. But I communicated that to them. I said, listen, I am not going to reach over and put my hand in front of your eyes like I did when you were four. That's your job to turn your eyes. You're, an, you're basically an adult. Biologically, you're an adult and you need to do this. You need to guard this. You need to fight to protect what is valuable so that when you offer it to the woman of your dreams and the woman that you've chosen to marry, it will be a valuable offering. And, um, and now, of course, anyone who's, who's, who's experienced maybe where their innocence was stolen, they were raped, they were molested, or, or they just didn't know any better. They weren't taught any better. Listen, in that little analogy, you know, the ring got dirty in battle, but he cleaned it up and he still continued to guard it. The point is not that bad things never happen or, or that we never make a mistake. The point is that we continue to protect what, it, what is important. And we get up, we clean it up, we move on. And so for, for any of you children who maybe have been exposed to something, maybe you weren't that first, first voice in their experience about sex, or maybe their innocence was taken. As a parent, you still have the power in safety and in love to communicate to them um, God's heart about sex. And will it be more difficult? Yeah, but we serve a redemptive healing God, and he literally can heal people from those things. Um, I, I know people who physically God healed their bodies when they had already lived like a, um, a, a sexually explicit life. Then later they met the Lord and they wanted to have a holy um, sexuality. They wanted God to redeem that part of their life. And I've, I've heard testimony after testimony of God healing women's bodies so that they could experience that blood covenant 
um, of the breaking of the hymen with, with their husband. I've also heard of women who God just wiped away and healed sexual experiences so that it wasn't um, a barrier in their mind. And so is there work there? Yes. But the reason there's work there is because this area of our lives is a gift. And even though I grew up in a totally um, Christian environment and I had a pretty healthy perspective of sex, I've still had my own hurdles to jump because there was still messaging that I received from the world that was wrong, that caused me to have um, judgments against my husband, you know, about like men are just after this and sex is selfish. Well, I've had to really overcome and work against that thinking that men liking sex is actually a God-given desire. And can it be selfish? Yeah. But is it always selfish? No way. Like, it's actually good and right for them to want to look at their wife and to appreciate your beauty and to want to be physically close to you. Like, that's actually a good thing. And so you can raise your kid in the most beautiful perfect harmonious environment when it comes to sex and they're still going to have stuff to work through and that's okay that's just part of being human so take a load off and breathe easier um but as parents of course we want to do our part to do our best and so i hope these tips were helpful um i believe i talked about everything on my list um and then my yeah my son his greatest tips were talk about it like it's normal because it is, it's normal. Um, my, I would recommend talking about it frequently. In fact, he mentioned that too. He's like, you just, you just have to talk about it regularly. Like talk about it. Like an, it's a normal thing. Talk about it frequently. Um, and then let's see, what was his other tip? Oh, don't treat it like it's bad. Treat it like it's private. And then of course I would say also explaining to your kids the boundaries around those conversations that it's so special and it's so important. It's something that parents are to talk about with their kids, but that it's not good um, to talk about it amongst your friends because, you know, that can that can um, become kind of not good territory. So having those boundaries established for your children will help. And boundaries help us feel safe. And establishing the, the lines for them that doesn't make them feel like there's all these bad rules attached it, it makes them feel safe because boundaries help us know where the safe places are. And so I hope this was helpful, guys. I would have included some of the audio recording with my son, and I might if I can go back and edit some pieces out that will be useful. But um, I, had, I should have recorded him the first time. He was brilliant the first time. Second time, he was kind of brain dead. So <laughs> uh, I'll see if I can splice in some little things at the end. But I hope that was helpful. And um you guys just remember the Lord's walking with you on this and no one does it perfectly. There is no such thing as perfect. Every family's different. Every family's way of dealing with it will be different. I think the main thing is drive your children back to the heart of God. What is God's why in it? And break off the shame attached to it. Make it something that's celebrated and beautiful, not something that's shameful and bad and secretive, you know? So anyways, you guys got this. You're awesome. Let me know. Send me messages if this was helpful or not helpful, or if you still have more questions or whatever, I'd love to hear from you guys. And stay with me, because now we're going to jump into life hacks. Okay, so for life hacks, you'll have to forgive me for the different acoustics I brought you into my bathroom while I'm putting on my makeup. <laughs> I need to get this episode up. I want y'all to hear it. Um, okay, so the little tips and tricks that I have learned losing weight over the years of four babies um, have been really simple things. I'm finding that the simple things that we do consistently bear more fruit than the dramatic things that we can do consistently. So here are some of the simple things that you can do that are easy to incorporate into your life that will have a positive impact on your weight loss efforts. Okay, number one is drink more water. I know. You're gonna feel like you're my kid at home and I'm asking you to stick your tongue out so I can see how dehydrated you are. No, drink water because you are 86% water. And water is what makes all your organs work, including your hormone balances and all the chemical processes in your body, which balances your metabolism. Water, when you hit about 80% dehydrated, the first thing that is negatively impact, impacted is your metabolism. 
So drinking water, and I did this a couple weeks ago, I didn't realize I was consistently dehydrated. So I just started intentionally drinking water and you know what I noticed? My appetite went up, which is a good sign that your metabolism is working. And so drink water, I just carry something big with me. I notice if I carry a small water bottle with me, I end up getting dehydrated throughout the day because it's not enough. And so carry a large cup with you, like 32 ounces or get one of those huge gallon size ones um, drink more water. Okay. Second would be kind of connected. When I'm eating, I eat my fruits and my vegetables first as much as possible. Not going to lie. Sometimes if I'm at a restaurant, they put a bread basket in front of me. I'm going to eat that first. Um, but that's because they haven't brought my salad yet, you know? So, but if you eat your fruits and vegetables first, what happens is you both get filled up with fiber. You also get filled up with the water that is in those and it will take up so much room in your stomach you will not feel the need to eat nearly as much of your meal and then you'll have leftovers so you won't have to cook the next day it's a win-win so eat your fruits and vegetables first and then hit your protein because that's going to be good nutrition that your body can 100 percent use and if your body the trick with storing fat versus i mean storing fat versus burning fat when you eat something, if your body cannot use it, like it cannot break it down and use it nutritionally, it will either get passed out as waste or more commonly stored as fat. That's why processed foods make us gain weight. Your body cannot digest them or utilize the nutrition that is not there. And so you end up storing it as fat. So even cutting out processed food makes a huge impact. Okay, so fruits and vegetables first, drink your water, Third would be, I found that when I make an even swap, try to, like, if I find that I'm struggling, my thing is sugar. Sugar is my weakness. I have a sweet tooth. So what I had to do is start to create new um, swaps and exchanges for things I love to eat. I love chocolate. Now, chocolate actually is pretty good for you. And so what I do is I just try to eat less of it. Instead of eating a Snickers bar, I'll just eat semi-sweet chocolate chips and do like a, a quarter cup or an eighth of a cup. Um, but I just found chocolate chips that are sweetened with stevia. And so that is going to be my new, um, go-to, uh, alternative. So find an even swap. If you like bread, just swap bread for more nutritional bread that has lots of fiber and protein in it. I love me some 12 grain bread because I love all the nuts in it and stuff. And your body can actually use it nutritionally. So your body will be able to burn it. And so you're helping heal your body by finding good swaps. And I find that when I have an even swap that I can make, instead of giving up something altogether, then it's more maintainable. So when I was giving up sugar, another thing I did is I adopted a love for stevia. Most people don't love stevia. I love stevia. And so what I have done is when I go to Starbucks, instead of getting one of those normal, regular drinks, I just get their skinny drinks. I keep stevia in my purse in a little squirty bottle, and I just sweeten my drink. Get iced tea, I get it unsweetened, and I put stevia in it. And so, there's if you can make swaps, then you can maintain certain life choices that are going to be healthier for you. Um, another tip is if you are finding that that thing that grips you is just hard to get away from. This one's a little more hardcore. Try fasting from it for 21 days. The reason I say 21 days is because we all know it takes 21 days to build a habit, right? Well, it also takes 21 days chemically in your body to alter your cravings. Once you're a week in, you're doing good. That second week can be difficult, but if you can get three weeks without that thing and you've been giving yourself something else instead, so stevia instead of sugar or healthy bread instead of crappy bread, then your body is gonna develop a new appetite. I found when I did a, um, a certain specific diet that was meant to retrain my, met my metabolism, I was in the habit of not eating fruits and vegetables or vegetables. When I did this, it required a vegetable with every meal. I found that I started craving vegetables totally weird but I did and it's because you can train your body to like different things so try 21 days without dairy just find good exchanges when it comes to dairy I adopted a new love which I like it even better 
um, this butter that's avocado and plant-based. It's actually cheaper at the grocery store to get it. It's country crock, but it's real stuff and it's plant-based and I really like it. I think it works better in my pans, like slicking them up, you know? Um, it tastes good, it melts more easily, so I don't have to fight with a stiff stick of butter, you know? I just love it. So um, just make your little swaps and then 21 days will reset your cravings. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Your fifth tip, look, I'm giving you guys the game plank here. I'm just giving you all the good stuff. Your fifth tip is your gut health. If you find that you have a lot of digestive issues, that is probably what is at the core of your weight struggles. So one simple thing that I do that really helped to get my digestion under control is every day I have apple cider vinegar. I think it's nasty and it smells and tastes like vomit. So I hate apple cider vinegar. So what I've started to do is I buy the LaCroix sodas they're um they're unsweetened they're just sparkling water flavored sparkling water i get the key lime you can do it with a few of the flavors all the citrus ones work really well with this and i'll put ice i'll put my Lacroix soda water i'll put in a tablespoon or two of apple cider vinegar with the mother it has to have the good stuff in it and then i'll throw in some stevia to sweeten it and y'all it tastes like sprite it's so good, it's an enjoyable drink. When I'm on a diet or I'm trying to be careful what I'm eating, drinking that feels like a treat, but it's really good for me. And so that's the number one way I get apple cider vinegar into my system. Another thing you can do is first thing in the morning, if your digestive system is really jacked up, first thing in the morning, a cup of water, a tablespoon or two of apple cider vinegar, throw in some honey or stevia um, just to make it more swallowable um, and then drink it down when you do that on an empty stomach it kickstarts your kidneys and your, the detoxing of what's going through your body it will move your digestion so you have a great healthy bowel movement early in the day which a lot of times when people are sluggish and tired it's because their their bowel system their digestive system is is bogged down with all kinds of toxins so doing this in the morning sometimes I'll even add lemon juice to it um, cause that helps as well. And it just, I have energy. I don't even have to have coffee on those days because it just gets my body awake and working. So gut health is important. Eat things with good bacteria in it. You can do yogurt, you can do, um, anything that's really fermented. I mean, I don't know about wine. I don't know where wine falls on that. It's got a lot of sugar, but apple cider vinegar, is my tip. Otherwise, try probiotics. If you don't like apple cider vinegar, start taking probiotics. You just need stuff to help nourish your gut and that will help your metabolism. Okay, so the next step that I found, this is number six, I found that my, I've always been kind of somewhat lean, but I still have to work to be like, lean like I like. Um, my thyroid was struggling and I started identifying this because I had done a lash boost serum by Rodan and Fields that has done wonders for me in the past. I used a whole tube and found that it did not grow my lashes at all. That was so weird. And then my hair seemed like it was thinning out and my face, my skin felt like it was aging. I was having weird like subtle body symptoms that just felt like something wasn't right. And so through some online research and looking up my symptoms and whatever, whatever, I realized every time I go to the naturopath, he says I'm low in iodine. Well, apparently most of America is low in iodine. We don't get iodine in our diet very well, very easily. And even the iodine that's added to salt is a low quality form of iodine. So it doesn't give our bodies everything we need. So I started taking iodine daily. And you know what I noticed? My eyelashes started growing in longer. My hair started filling back out. My skin started looking better. And I started finding that my efforts to lose a couple pounds were more effective. So take iodine. Iodine is good for you. It's something you can take on a regular basis. It, it feeds your thyroid balance, which your thyroid controls your metabolism. So it feeds your thyroid. It also feeds your female reproductive system. So it helps with all the PMS and all that kind of stuff, helps you sleep. Iodine is wonderful. So iodine, check that out. Last thing is, some of you have heard of intermittent fasting. Again, this comes back to digestion. Digestion is at the bottom of most of these, I feel like. Um, intermittent fasting is something I 
discovered I like fasting um, because mostly for spiritual reasons it's a very powerful form of prayer um, but I like how it heals the body as well so intermittent fasting is where you'll pick a window of time that you choose to do all your eating for the day and then there's a larger window of time where you do not eat do not take in any calories so I do an eight hour window where I eat 11 to 7 or 12 to 8 and I'll fit all my meals in that time. It's easy to do. Um, that window I feel like is easy. Sometimes I'll fudge it by an hour or so. Uh, but what I found is it eased up my digestion. I was, I was having a lot of bloating and digestive issues. It eased up my digestion because what it does is instead of your digestion having to work for 16 hours out of the day or 20 hours out of the day if you're a late night eater, um, then it frees that up. So instead your gut can work on things like, oh, I don't know, your metabolism <laughs> and nourishing your body and so by easing up on your digestion it frees you up to um, actually eat less because you're eating in a smaller window of time but I mean you have, need to have your full day's calories but it, it's naturally easier to eat less in a smaller window of time but it eases up your digestion one thing that Wolverine did in, in, in alignment with this, he did intermittent fasting when Hugh Jackman, I'm sorry, Hugh Jackman, when he was training for the role of Wolverine, he, uh, in order to get in shape really fast, and I mean, he was cut, right? Uh, he stopped eating carbs after 3 p.m. And then I think he stopped eating altogether after 5 p.m. And the reason why is, think about it, you don't burn as many calories in the evening unless you go work out in the evening. Um, and so, what you don't burn, you end up storing. So if you just don't eat carbs after 3 p.m., instead err on the side of protein, which feeds your muscles, or fruits and vegetables, which fills you and, and gives you lots of nutrients, don't eat carbs after 3 p.m., and that's a great way to kind of cut back and allow your body to use what you're eating, burn it efficiently, and feed your metabolism. So anyways, again, real quick, drink more water, eat fruits and vegetables first, and then protein. If you struggle with something, may find an even swap, which will make it easier to sustain healthier choices. Mine was I swapped sugar for stevia, um, and that has made my life a whole lot easier and, and made it easy to give up sugar. Um, 21 days without something, if you find an insane craving you just can't do, or you're trying to figure out if something is troubling your health, try cutting it out of your diet for 21 days. Um, it will allow you to see if maybe it's causing reactions in you that you didn't realize you had, inflammation, or it will change, help your body change your cravings into healthier cravings when you exchange those things for healthier options. Okay, your gut health, you need to take care of your gut health. Apple cider vinegar every day is easy, helps with fat burn, helps with me metabolizing your food, helps with keeping your gut cleaned up and your digestion, actually helps with acne, adult acne too. Um, iodine, your thyroid can struggle if you get low in iodine. And so taking iodine, which most Americans don't get enough of, and then intermittent fasting and not eating carbs after 3 p.m. All of these are tips that I have found are helpful over all my years of trying to lose weight from four different babies. So I hope these are helpful for you. Um, share with a friend if you liked, and I, I hope they're gonna help you guys out. Um, thank you for participating in the giveaway we did this week, guys. It was super exciting to hit 7,000 downloads. My next goal is 10,000. I love doing giveaways. So um, also, if you guys have a life hack that you think would be great for the other listeners to hear, find me on Instagram, Java with Jen. Send me a message and tell me what your life hack is because I want to know because I'm always looking for life hacks to include in these episodes. So thanks for listening. I love you guys. I hope you guys are having a wonderful holiday season. Stay healthy, stay well, and make sure to stay in touch most of all. Love y'all. Talk to you later. Bye. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's show. For those of you who've rated or shared this podcast on social media, thank you. Reading your comments and reviews always means so much to me. Listen, let's stay connected. Come follow me on Instagram at Java with Jen, where you can follow the latest and say hey. It's a really great way to stay in touch. Many of you have also asked how you can support the show. You can make donations through the Anchor app or on Patreon, or of course, by sharing, rating, and reviewing on social media and iTunes as well. 
Thank you to each of you for your ongoing support. Your heartfelt feedback always reminds me why I do this. Until next time, remember, you've got this and God's got you.